All right, Elliot, we're back. Day two. Yesterday was the mechanics of efficient rental growth. Today, the anatomy of building a powerful sales team. We're back. You showed up for day two. I did, and I'm excited, brother. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you once again for making this happen. Yeah, this is your sweet spot. You've got you very talented person, but sales is your is superpower. So I'm excited to to talk about this. And obviously, for the people listening in tomorrow, another great episode. Uh, unlocking new markets and niches, but this is really around sales, the lifeblood of of any rental company. Um, we decided to jump in. Just want to say hi to some people: Austin, Eddie, Buck, Matt, uh, Cord's in here. Justin Renford's back. Good to see Renford. Ryan, Steve's back again. Zach, Nathan, more people trickling in. So welcome, and feel free to chat questions in to Elliot. I've got a lot of questions to ask myself, but as we go through this, really nothing's off limits. So ask questions, to Elliot. Uh, we're lucky to have him today. So. Um, Elliot, for today's uh, session, I wanted to think about as we build a powerful sales team, sort of, I got some questions to talk about, but but maybe thinking about like the life cycle of a rental business and really mm -hmm. starting from the beginning. I've got an idea, I'm starting a rental company and just me. And I, now I've hired some mechanics and then I've hired some salespeople and I've expanded locations. Now all of a sudden I'm United Rentals, right? But <laughs> <laughs> ideally, right? But yeah, kind of get yeah. that journey and um, we're going to talk about the hiring and building out the sales organization and, and all those things is, is a big topic today. But um, we talked to a lot of people who are, they are the sales team and they are yeah. the, the one man show in some level. And, and and maybe starting with that point, as we think about building the sales organization, you got to build it yourself first. And I think it's important to do the job yourself first. So um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. It's kind of going through that, the, the different phases, but maybe starting with um, you're the person yourself. How do I grow my business with sales? Maybe with the marketing. Talk to me about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I, I, I think that's a great one. I get bumped in with that question quite often. And it's interesting because it is exactly what you said, Kyle. Um, hey, I, I went out, I, I came from a history of rental or I knew somebody who had rental. So I went out and I got a truck. I got two mechanics. I got a driver. I got somebody on the counter. I'm in charge of sales. The problem is, is sales aren't doing what they need to do. So how do I create sales as a quote, business owner and business operator. Um, if I'm gonna give you, let's, let's call it 3.5 great piece of advice. Number one is discipline. Discipline is king. So the problem that happens is, is that the rental industry, we all become crisis managers. I've stated this a million times. What we do is our phone rings and we're answering it. We got it covered. And a customer needs a key and we're jumping in the truck and we're delivering it. The problem is, is that's great when the business is just starting off. But once you're six, to eight months in, pretty soon you're not going to be spending a whole lot of time doing sales calls. You're going to be putting out fires. And I would tell you that the one thing you have to do is train your team. Look at your schedule. The two slowest days for rental companies historically, and this takes in all rentals. Um, actually, Kyle may have some great software data on this. What are the slowest days of the week for booking orders, delivering orders, and taking calls? And if I had to guess from all my history, it's Wednesdays and Thursdays. Wednesdays and Thursdays are substantially slower than Monday, big delivery day, lost keys and breakdowns, and Fridays, lots of ordering or pre-deliveries for Monday. So if Wednesdays and Thursdays are your two slowest days, have the discipline to go make sales calls. Now, sales calls don't always have to be out in the field. It's good if they're out in the field because if you roll up to a job site, you can find opportunities. You know, I often, people ask me all the time, they're like, do you need to go to a job site? Absolutely not. But here's the thing, those businesses have business. They're building something. They have immediate needs. So you can go call on anyone, but I can tell you that construction job sites are a great place to find leads. Um, I would also strongly recommend that on those Wednesdays and Thursdays when you're out making sales calls, try and be relatively focused. So I will tell everybody right now that if you go into your phone, and if you're sitting at your branch, and I don't care if you've got an Android or Apple products, whatever you've got, if you go into your phone and you go to the map app, and in the map app, you type in electrical 
contractor. Now you'll see it'll auto populate right on the top. And if you click on electrical contractors, why don't you let latest technology show you where all of the electrical contractors are in and around your current location. So right here, it gave me 25, which is the maximum number that Apple will allow, 25 contractors with their website and information, if you just scroll down, and all of those are within seven miles. So here's the big thing of that. You don't wanna go out chasing deals. You wanna find stuff that's in your own backyard. The reason why is what we discussed yesterday. If there's breakdowns, if there's deliveries, if there's an immediate need for a lost key, you don't have the time or capacity to drive 45 miles. So these are some of the key things. Find stuff that's near and dear to you. Here's number three. Number three is make sure you follow up. Now, for me, I treat it as second nature. I just, I know follow up because I'm a salesperson. But I see a lot of business owners and what they end up doing is they go in and they say, wow, I walked by, I saw a job site, I handed the guy my business card or I handed the gal my business card. They took my business card and said, thanks for stopping by. They've never called me. The reason why is it takes a minimum of five visits hmm. before people know, like, and begin to trust you. So as a business owner, rather than use the shotgun effect, and the shotgun effect is, is I'm just going to go out and send one bullet into the air a million places, use the laser beam. Pick a couple of key accounts within that five to 10 mile radius of your branch and call on them once a week for six weeks. I will guarantee you results. The problem is, is people go around and they think that, that putting their business card in a fishbowl is going to drive revenue. It doesn't. If you put your business card up on a tack board in somebody's office, it's not going to drive revenue. You need to build a reputation by visiting people. Now, here's the point five. I had a business owner and he says, oh, I get it. You just nag the heck out of people. <laughs> no, it is not nagging the heck out of people. So here's the key thing. Set up a structure of how do I add value on every visit? Maybe that value is, hey, we got a new product and I wanted to let you know about it. I wanted to drop off a line card on some of the items we offer. I wanted to tell you about an upcoming charity event that I'm participating in. Hmm. Every one of those adds value to your potential customer, to your prospect, and it gives you a reason to stop by. Nobody wants somebody to stop by and do the Forrest Gump. Hmm. They want somebody to stop by and help their business. So if you have a plan on how to help their business, they will give you their most valuable asset, their time. Mm. Interesting. So five, a lot of things you said there, but five yep. visits to know that to build trust and you don't want to be Forrest Gump, but like, what are five things, like what are five reasons to go visit someone, right? Is it, is it, Hey, I got a box of donuts or Hey, we're having this event. Like what, what are some of the reasons to, because in some sense, you have to fabricate reasons to make those five visits, right? And it's got to be value to the to the end user. Um, what are some examples of things that people could do to justify a visit that that would offer value to the end user? That's a brilliant. That's a brilliant one right there. So here's here's a big one: special products or special features. So if it's if it's Quipply or if it's somebody who's going out and they're visiting and they want to rent equipment, hey, I just wanted to let you know. We just got in a brand new order of skid steers. They come with grapple buckets. They come with tooth buckets. They come with smooth buckets. They're in closed cab with AC, and they've come with a radio system inside. They're ideal for the users. I thought that would be something that maybe your operators would enjoy. Mm. Now, they're visualizing how they could use you and your products. That's a great stop. Stopping by and saying, hey, I realize what, what day do you do your project manager's meeting, your subcontractor's meetings? I would love to cater that. I would love to bring in, like you said, donuts. I'd love to bring in um, a edible arrangements, you know, those big fruit baskets, something unique and fun. I want to make sure that I become a partner to your company and I'll stop by and drop that off. 
Then you want to look at, hey, do you have any upcoming projects that I could look at, evaluate, um, come up with an equipment plan? And it forces people to think about what do they have planned for the next four to five weeks? And here's why that's important. How many times do you make what I call the emergency reaction? And if I told you right now, you got to you gotta phone a friend, you're going to call the same rental company you've always called. But if somebody walks into your office and says, hey, what do you have coming up in the next three to four weeks? And you say, oh, well, we got a project kicking off next Monday. Perfect. What equipment can I get you for next Monday? Hmm. And all of a sudden you're breaking their patterns and their habits, but you got to be the person who plans. You just can't say, Hey, I hope I get lucky enough that I walk in the day you're ordering a piece of equipment five minutes before you order it. And you give that order to me. That just doesn't happen often enough. Hmm. Yeah. Well, well, the examples you gave and all those examples, it's things that benefit the end customer. It's do you, do you want free food? <laughs> do you want, uh, a better product because we have a new product that came out. I want to let you know about that. Um, are you going to be in a bind because of these upcoming projects? How can I help you? Right. It's not the Forrest Gump. It's the, Hey, how can I offer value? And the thing that's sort of stuck out to me, cause I'm a, uh, you know, my background is engineering and I'm an introvert, you know, one visit for me uh, would be a lot, but I think there's an element of like, I went there, they didn't call back. So they must not be interested in, in the product or in our, in our company. Right. But you're saying you got to go five times that that's the magic number in your mind. Yeah. And, and I'll give you, and I'll give you an example. I, I know you're married. Um, we've discussed this. So here's the thing. I want you to think about the first time you went on a date with your wife. Now you remember that first date. And if you sat there and you said to her, you know, here's my phone number. Um, I hope to talk to you in the next six to eight weeks. You wouldn't be married right now. You'd be a single guy. If you said, why don't you follow up with me in six to eight weeks? Now, it was an amazing first date. And guess what you did? You followed up with her maybe the next day. First thing the next morning, you made proper follow-ups because the goal is, which we have to do, is you have to build trust, which is built through consistency and great interactions. Problem is, is people can't, I, I like, you wouldn't trust me with your business. Let's just talk real frank. You're not going to be like, hey, Elliot, I'm going to trust you with Quipley, and I have no clue who you are. But here's the keys to my office. Have a great time. Mm -hmm. But now that you and I have bumped into each other on podcasts, now that we've bumped into each other at shows, now that we've helped each other and we've grown, guess what? There's going to be a day where you say, hey, if you're ever in the, uh, if you're ever in the Atlanta area, why don't you come by for dinner? And isn't it interesting because this is a prime example of how you build those relationships. And mm -hmm. every time we talked, we added value to one another in a different way. Mm -hmm. Now, we're two business people, but this is a prime example of what affects everyone watching this podcast. Every single person who watches it is saying they're exactly right. Your customer didn't come in one time and say, hey, I'm going to give you all my business. You had to earn that by repeatedly giving great service. Mm -hmm. And then if it's somebody you didn't have business with, you had to repeatedly go by and show them, I care and I'm willing to put in the work ahead of time because I know what the reward is. And that's the honor of doing business with your company. Mm -hmm. I mean, you nailed it right there. It's about relationships. It's about trust. It's about consistency. I think, you know, our relationship is a great example of that over the last few years of introduction I see in six months we run into each other and it's been enough positive interactions that we obviously have a lot of trust with each other but if you came in on the first thing it was like hey i'm going to sell you on something it would or vice versa it's just not going to work that way and if you're going to do one visit maybe you can get a deal that way and it, it does happen but that's not how people operate anymore people are smart and they want to feel you out and they want to know the you know that's why you know the online marketing matters and the, and the google reviews and all the other stuff it's a full circle um but you have to build the trust. And, and, and I, I just love the five visit thing because it's really the lazy thing is to send an email. Hey, have you made a decision? But it's, it's showing up in person with, with the value, you know, and offering the values that is the key part there. Yeah. And, and with that, and I'm going to, I'm going to tell people, um, I can send you the actual sheet. Like, like I'm not making these numbers up. I know they, they, I saw a funny statistic the other day that 
50% of all statistics are made up on the spot, <laughs> which is a great, which is a great thing, but I can actually send you and I'll, I'll send you the email where it shows where they did a study of all these sales reps, the odds of walking into somebody's office and you have salespeople that call on you. And just like, just like I want you to think of all the rental companies that are watching this salesmen walk into their company, walk into their rental yard, walk into their business all the time and say, Hey, do you guys need to buy lubricants? Hey, do you guys need to buy shop rags? Hey, do you get, and they do those pitches. And the thing is, is you say, every one of us says the exact same thing. I'm good, man. I'm good. Thanks for coming by. Um, if something changes, leave me a card. And you come by the next day and you build that relationship and you build that rapport over six to eight weeks. And all of a sudden, guess what that business owner is doing? And all of us are business owners on here, hopefully. And you look at it and you go, man, I don't know if I'm getting the best service from my lube guy. I don't know if I'm getting the best service from my uniform company. I don't know if the service is as good as this person is hustling. And you build that trust and rapport over time. Mm. I think for my own life, you know, every every week it's like I'm on some spam list. I get 100 emails about selling software services and all these things, right? But there's two things that have stood out to me that we're, we don't use them. But if I ever need to make that change, I'm going to talk call them first. One was a, uh, it's an investor, and they put out amazing content for software companies like us, like how to be better. You know, that's a sort of inspiration for what we're trying to do at a small scale. But how do we build a better business, right? And it's very specific to sort of what we do. They put it out for free. They have free conferences, free videos. That's number one. Number two, there's a there's a payment processing group who uh, organizes dinners. They bring in other CEOs and they say, hey, we're having a dinner in Atlanta. The, the, the CEO is going to be there. We're going to have 10 seats, free dinner at a, at a four or five star restaurant. Do you want to come? You know, I don't want to be sold to, but I, I'll go to a free dinner if I'm going to learn something, right, with with other leaders. And I think those are those are real touch points that I'm I'm not being it doesn't feel like a sales call, but it, what it feels is someone building trust with me. And okay, three years from now, guess what? If I need a new payment processor, I'm going to call them, right? And the same, same with the investor. So uh, I, I think in my own life, some of the examples that you shared um, sort of resonate with me. It's just really about being authentic and and, and offering value and not leading with mm. the on the first call, right? And that'll happen naturally afterwards, five, seven meetings, et cetera. But um, I, I love the examples that, that, that you gave. And I actually had a question from Ryan. I want to I want to answer, which sort of ties into this a little bit. Um, yeah. His question is, what are what are some best practices for ensuring we build long-term relationships with clients after those five visits? Which is a great question because now we're talking about, okay, we got that customer, mm -hmm. you know, we built those five, those, those five visits. They've now rented with us. Um, how do we continue to build those long-term relationships after that, that first rental transaction? That's a great question. Phenomenal question, Ryan. Um, I think one of the biggest things you have to do is there's a famous phrase out of sight, out of mind. And the rental business is all repeat business. We covered this yesterday. And if it's all repeat business, what are you doing to increase the touches and connectivity with your customers? So I am a huge proponent. If anyone, I, I don't have them right in front of me. Um, I send out thank you cards. And it sounds goofy and it sounds old school. And people are like, yeah, nobody does snail mail anymore, bro. And that's not what we do. I'll make, and, and we know Kyle's a big technology engineering guy. If Kyle, if you went home today, or if Ryan went home today, you pull up to your house, you open your mailbox, you pull out the mail. You're going to see there's advertisement. Oh, look, somebody wants you to vote for somebody different. Oh, look, citing for your house. Oh, two bills for credit cards. Oh, look, they're having a jewelry expo. And then there's a handwritten card. Hmm. Your address is handwritten. It's got a stamp on it. The return is handwritten. I will guarantee you, I'll put a hundred bucks on it. That's the first thing you open. Hmm. And the thing is, is the bills are more important. It says urgent right on the bill. <laughs> yeah. And you open up this personalized card and you pull it out and somebody took five minutes. I timed it one day because I wanted to see how hard was it to do. And it took me five minutes to send a thank you card. Hmm. Now, every single person out there wants one-on-one -on -one time with business decision makers. Everybody out there wants personalized time to thank someone for their business. They want to build trust. They want to build loyalty. 
When was the last time you went into your, what, however you control how you rent equipment, pulled up your top 10 accounts each month and sent those 10 accounts, the business, whoever the decision makers are, whoever the business owner is, and sent them a thank you letter. Mm. And the thank you letter should be as simple as this. Hey, Kyle, I realize that I'm a very small part of Quipley's business, but I want to let you know you are 100% of my business. And for that, I appreciate it. And please let me know if there's anything I can do to assist you on future products or future projects. We are extremely grateful for the business you give us. Thanks and have a great day. Less than five minutes, handwritten inside of a card, and I would send that off to my customers and it built a massive level of loyalty. I just sent out cards for what I do. And I booked seven deals off of sending out thank you cards. I wow. sent out 20, I sent out 25. That's a pretty good hit rate. It's, That's it's, a pretty good hit rate. 2024. And this is the same. Um, they didn't have Zoom in 1924, but it would be the same thing, right? A thank you card, right? Handwritten. Because it's lazy to do, easy to do the email because you can do a thousand emails at the same time, but it's the effort, you know. And I mean, you sent me a card uh, at the ARA show. It was uh, the Lego card. So thank you for making for helping let me participate in what you're building. You had a gift card in there, so I I, I talked to how many thousand people at the ARA show like you did, but I remember that right because it's different. It's I guess you're what you're saying is you're doing things that are distinct to show that you care about the customer, and the extra mile in this case is five minutes. Can you do an extra five minutes, right? Um, That's right. You know, those thank you cards. Are you doing that for, um, I guess, current customers, right? You're, you're, you're saying it to current customers. And, and here's the thing is that every one of us has what is known as buyer's remorse. And buyer's remorse resonates with everybody. They rented a piece of equipment. It didn't start. The start cord broke. Um, they got the bill. And when they booked it, they didn't realize that there was expenses for a uh, a service call, there was there was expensive for environmental fees and the person gets the bill and guess what? They're a little, I don't know if I'm gonna use that rental company again. And all of a sudden they go out to their mailbox and there's a thank you note. I hate to say it, but it reminds people you care. And every one of us will pay more for somebody who cares about us. Mm. And yeah. so I'm going to ask everybody out there, I don't, I don't need you to be what I call a mastermind salesperson. I don't need you to be, you know, freaking the, the go-to person when it comes to sales. But if you are willing to take every month and send out 10 thank you cards to your customers, I will guarantee you, here's the thing, none of your competitors are doing that. And if a letter comes into a business, if the bill comes in, does it go to the owner of the company? And I'm thinking if I owned a construction company, if a bill comes in, does it go to me as the owner? Nope, it goes to my accounting girl. I never see it. But if a thank you card comes in with my name on it, it goes straight to my desk. And guess who ultimately makes the decisions? Mm. Now, I'm going to ask everybody, could you come up with 35, 40 minutes in a month to write 10 thank you cards to your top 10 customers that month? And the answer is absolutely yes. So why aren't you doing it? Hmm. Why, why don't people do it? Um, because, because the thing is, is just like you said, everybody's looking for the easy button. And when they get home, they're like, look, I don't want to sit down. I don't want to go through handwriting out stuff. I don't have great handwriting. I, I don't know how to do that. I'm going to tell you right now, it, it's great that you say it, but you just stated, it. I sent you that card over a year ago. Yeah. And you just said, you sent me a Lego card. Let's build something together with a gift card inside of it. That is, and, and you remember it, it resonated with you. Hmm. And guess what? When you make those personal connections, I don't just preach about it. I do it. Hmm. And when you sit there and you catch people when you want to catch them. And here's the thing, a lot of business owners like yourself are not hardcore, let's go out and make sales calls kind of people. And that's okay. But you at least need to do something sales-wise. You need to structure some kind of sales. And if that's customer outreach, if that's mail, if it's inviting people into an open house at your branch, you've got to do something to drive sales.
you know, one of the biggest things I find right now is I'm going around calling on rental companies and every one of them is doing the, our utilization changed in the last nine months. Really, what changed in your utilization? Well, we were sitting at 65 to 70%. Now we're at 45%. Oh my gosh, what happened? We have no clue. And I asked them, well, what are you doing to drive sales? Well, the same thing we've always done. The thing is, is the market changed and people didn't evolve with it. Mm. And so if, if I'm going to tell you right now, the clues and the things that you put out, the knowledge you share, I'll give people like three or four key things today, but Man, if you don't go out and try and land business, your customers right now are being massively attacked by companies that are in the same boat you are. They went from 65% utilization to 45%. And somebody's saying, we got a quota to hit. Go full court press. Attack. <laughs> yeah. When thing, when um, the thing, the market's getting more competitive, right? And And we actually have two questions here. One of them relates to that. Um, and then I want to get back to the, the team building side of things, which we haven't covered yet on the sales side. But um, one of the questions is any good strategies for trying to win back customers you've lost after some issues with the rental, i.e. machine breaks down, which which I'm sort of dovetailing into what you're talking about also is when your utilization is low, well, then likely everyone else's utilization is low and they're going to be coming after your customers. So this is more of a maybe customer retention question or winning back customers how do you do that once you've lost them, particularly if you did something to uh, maybe not deliver a great service? Yeah, I think that's a brilliant question. I, I've had one where I had a customer fill a death tank with diesel fluid. Now, everybody who's on this call knows exactly what just happened. But that's a blown engine. Okay, it's not a little blown engine. It is a big blown engine and it's massively expensive. Everybody on this video just cringed hearing that. And I lost the customer. Did I do anything wrong? No. But he wasn't happy because of the bill that was tacked along with it. 100% his fault. Hmm. And it forced me to learn. It's not that I'm smarter than anybody. I've just failed more than everybody else. And I learned from my failures. So here's my piece of advice. I got a book and the book is by Chris Voss. And Chris Voss wrote a book called Never Split the Difference. And he is an FBI hostage negotiator. And Chris Boss said an amazing statement, which I think most people fail to do, is we are taught, quote, don't ruffle people's feathers. Don't, don't go in and cause problems. You know, don't make ripples in the water. The truth is, is you got to bring the negative to light. Mm -hmm. And what the negative to light is, is I'm <laughs> going to assume the question that came in. Let's say we sent a piece of equipment. It broke down. We sent a service tech. He said it was fixed. It broke down again. Um, we picked the unit up. We dropped off a new one. The new one was there for five minutes and it blew a hydraulic line. And the customer's like, look, I can't have three breakdowns in two days. I'm done with you. I'm never renting from you again. Now that's a worst case scenario. So how do you get that customer back? And the first thing I say is don't avoid them. That has never worked well. Get into a disagreement with somebody like your significant other and avoid them. Let me know how that goes. It's <laughs> not going to go well. The best thing you can do is bring the negative to light. Walk up to that customer, go right into their office, get a meeting with the decision maker and say, hey, Kyle, I want to apologize to you. I made a mistake. I realize in business, mistakes happen. And our equipment breaking down, you were a victim of a terrible series of circumstance. The truth is, is that isn't how we conduct business. Now, I realized that at that moment, you were frustrated, I was frustrated. It lost you time and it lost you money. Two things you can't make enough of. So the one thing I wanna do is I accept 100% responsibility for what happened. The buck stops here. I'm not blaming my shop. I'm not blaming my drivers. I'm not blaming anybody. It is my responsibility as your account manager and the person who takes care of you to make sure your business runs effectively. And then here's the key phrase. What do I need to do to make this right? 
and you shut up. Now, I've watched people where they walk in, I'll give you your next rental for free. I'll give you this for free. I'll, I'll discount this. I'll give you that. I did this one time with a sales rep. And I said, what do I need to do to make this right? And I shut up. And here's what the business owner said. The fact that you accept responsibility and you're here in front of me, that's all I needed. Mm. And he gave us an order. Mm. He hadn't done business with that company for over a year. But the biggest thing is, is you have to accept responsibility, bring the negative to light. Don't assume what it takes to make it right. Ask, what do I need to do to make this right? And then guess what? It puts the iota, it puts the challenge back on the customer that they need to create a solution. And then it's up to you to decide, is that something I can fulfill? Is that something I can do? But if you just avoid that customer, if they say, I never want to see you again, and you're like, see ya. Um, I have seen many of those that just the best thing you can do is try get yeah. in front of them. That last three well, minutes, we're going to like snippet that that's a whole class on what you just described. Uh, <laughs> I just have a lot of comments on that. Uh, I've been married over six years, so not that long, but part of our marriage counseling, when we got married, the the best thing, the best advice I've ever gotten for marriage was the phrase, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? And that has saw, that has ended so many conflicts that would have taken hours to resolve. And the other thing I wanted to say is Never Split the Difference is an amazing book. I just listened to it uh, three months ago. So plugging that for people listening, it's for free on Spotify. You can listen to it. There um, it is. But, but the thing I'll say is what he talks a lot, a lot about in this book, as you know, is you're just listening and you're repeating back to them. And the key phrase you want to hear back is that's right. And it's not you're right. Because if they say you're right, that means they've sort of resigned to the fact that it's an argument and they just want to end the conversation. Like, yeah, you're right. If you hear you're right, that's actually terrible. What you want to hear is that's right. You've nailed it. I have heard you. You've you've listened uh, to exactly what what I was saying. And when, so when you replay when you replay back to a customer, hey, we messed up this, blah, blah, blah. Did I get that right? And they'll keep kind of giving you tweaks and you keep going until they get to, yep, you've nailed it. You've a hundred percent heard what, what the issue was. Um, that that's a huge part of that. So uh, I love what you just said there. It's taking ownership, right? And it sounds so obvious and easy. And the reality is if you just do the things that you described, you're in the top 10% because most people won't do it. They'll blame uh, the weather and, you know, that guy over there and, and just saying, look, I was wrong. I'm sorry. What can we do to make it right and shut up and listen, right? That's it. I, I got nothing more to say. You nailed it. You just nailed it. Well, I see. I just replayed back to you, right? You just said that's right. So I'm showing the, you know. Um, all right. I want to get to another question we have here um, it's about referrals. So going go back to the sales side. So everyone asks me about referrals, one of the best ways to find new business. I do it, but it is awkward. Are there any smooth ways to ask for referrals and then approach those referrals? Um, I've heard the same thing too, right? Because I'm an introvert. I don't do this and I probably should. So I'm also asking for myself. How do you ask for referrals in a way that doesn't feel super cringe? Perfect. Ready? I'm going to do the super cringe so that we all feel it. Okay. <laughs> super turn cringe. Turn my video off because it's going to be that cringe. <laughs> it is going to be that cringe. Ready, Kyle? Hey, Kyle, I was wondering, um, can you give me some other people that would use my services? Okay. Now you ready? Here's And, and I try to make it as smooth as possible. Here's the non-cringe. Hey, Kyle, look, we've done these podcasts a couple of times. What can I do to do a better job to help you and your client base? Oh, Elliot, you're doing a great job. Perfect. But is there anything I could tighten up or take my services to the next level? You know what? Maybe if you guys uh, could, could take care of the environmental fees or make those lower, that'd be great. Perfect. So if I understand you right, if I could get rid of some of those environmental fees, it would literally be a perfect situation for you. Absolutely, Elliot. So let me ask you one last thing, Kyle. Do you know anybody else or can you think of somebody who you would recommend my services to? Yes, yes, I have I have a list of people here for you. Yeah, and you're sitting there and you're like, look, I know rental companies that can use your services. I have other software companies that can use your services. Absolutely, yes, I know people that can use your services. But you want to key up, and the biggest thing is, is mention, let's make it as good of an experience as possible. If somebody says it's perfect, guess what every one of us likes to do? Kyle, tell me about the best restaurant in Atlanta. 
and you're like, oh, Elliot, I went to this point. You'll share it in a heartbeat. Yeah. And you won't even feel, guess what? You're going to recommend it with no problems at all. So I will tell you right now, if you give amazing service and you ask a customer, how's the service? And they say it's nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10, say, perfect. Is there anyone else you can think of that I might be able to offer those same level of service up to? And everybody is happy to give you a referral. The problem is that we've just never been coached on how to ask. Hmm. And I think a lot of what you're talking about is like, you know, our, I think people want the shortcuts, the tactic. If I say this phrase, I'm going to get the deal on the first call, right? And what you're saying is you got to show up five times, offer value five times. You got to write handwritten notes. You got to ask multiple times, how can we be better? And once you've done all those things, you've earned the right to ask for a referral, right? And if you came out of the, like your first example, hey, can I, I need to get more customers for myself. Can you give me two or three? Like that's not going to go so well, right? You only, it's like the pyramid. At the very tip of the, at the pyramid, you've earned the right to ask for a referral, but that's only after everything else has been, you've known the customer for a while, you've served them well, you continue to ask for feedback, you've written the thank you notes. Then that last question, it's more of an obvious, natural uh, way to do it. And a lot of the things you're talking about, it's, it's very natural. If you're doing things in the right order, it should just be a natural thing that happens. Uh, to quote my friend, Chris Voss, that's right. <laughs> I'm glad you said that's that. Right. That's not your right. Um, that's right. So, uh, okay, Ryan's got two more questions. I actually want to get to the team question, boss. His other question here: Any particular creative or unique uh, types of discounts or incentives that could be used to close um, new customers? More of a tactic, but again, anything on the discounting yeah. or incentive packaging that that could be used for new customers. Yeah. So one of the ones I used to use quite a bit. I don't. So here's the thing: If you start off by discounting or giving away stuff free. Don't turn into the red hot chili peppers. And we all know what they taught. Give it away, give it away, give it away now. Um, I think you have somebody who works on your team who that's their motto, right? Yeah, discount Dusty. I want to see if he's listening. Discount Dusty, yeah. So here's the thing I would recommend is oftentimes- when... in, So you make a message from Dustin. He's on here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing I would recommend is when you go in, there he is. There's oh, Dusty oh, right oh, there. Oh. <laughs> so here's the thing I would recommend is if you go into a new account, I always tell them, I had a sales rep who told me nobody ever fills out credit apps. And I want to get customers to fill out credit apps. So I would tell the customer and listen to the phrasing. And you'll hear how smooth this rolls off. Hey, Kyle, listen, I would love to do business with you. I want you to fill out this credit app. You can do it online. Um, it's really simple. But here's the thing. I value your time. So here's what I'm going to do is if you fill out a credit app, and you open up an account and you put something on rent. For that first rental, I will give you free pickup and free delivery. Now, right now, free pickup and free delivery is normally a minimum of $150 each way, which means that's a $200 savings. So if you spend 30 minutes to an hour filling out a credit app, I'm willing to reimburse you for your time $300. Is that something that would interest you for your first rental, as well as discounting to introduce you to our company. Now, here's the thing. How much is trucking going forward after the first rental? It's 150 bucks each way. We already covered this. Where if you go in and say, hey, I'm going to give you a 50% discount, that becomes the expectation. Mm -hmm. If you say, hey, your introductory rate is a 19 foot scissor for 250 bucks. That's not a great thing because guess what the accountant says? Hey, the rate went up. This guy's messing with us. But if you tell the owner of the company, the trucking is normally 150 each way. I'm willing to give you the delivery for free. You just pay the pickup. Now, what ends up happening is, is the customer understands there is a cost associated with it, but try not to discount rates. Hmm. Okay. Don't discount the core rate. You can discount the service around it. And what I like is that on the delivery, it's the very beginning of the rental. And I think what you're bet betting on also is on the service side, you're going to deliver great service, right? And I think I mentioned, I heard you on another um, podcast, you said great rental company, 90% of their business can be repeat rent renters, right? So if, if you believe that's true for your business, that's a really cheap way to get a repeat renter, right? 150 bucks, someone's going to rent with you. Right. In the next few years. That's exactly right. And it and it 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 keeps the the foundation of where it needs to be. But yeah, to to answer his question, if I was going to give anything, I would try and do trucking or pickup and delivery so that your rates stay true to the market. 
Mm. The, the, uh, discount Dusty, uh, defending himself, he works at Quipley, but he used to work at Synergy Equipment. He said he also uh, always used to give them an extra day past their month for no charge <laughs> if they needed it. So that's that's this discount Dusty's way to do it. Um, that's exactly right. Uh, another question from Ryan, which I want to get to, uh, which, you know, we got 20 minutes left, but is really around building out the sales organization. We've, we've talked a lot about tactics mm -hmm. for and strategies like as the business owner yourself, but like we got to build an organization to scale, right? Because we're all going to be next United. So question he has is at what point should an equipment rental business with just a few people can consider expanding and hiring a salesperson or a sales team? Are there specific revenue milestones or other indicators that signal it's time? to make this move. So I guess the question is at what point do you start to think about building the sales team? And then my question on top of that is how do I do it? What am I looking for? Who am I hiring for? What's the scorecard? Talk to me about that part. Oh, well, the good thing is we got a full 20 minutes to cover like a five hour topic. So this is <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, great question, by the way. So there is no direct formula of when to hire salespeople. And here's why is if I sit there and I say, look, you have to have $10 million in fleet. $10 million in fleet is completely different for a mom and pop shop that may never be that big. But if you do somebody who's a big earth moving company, like a Caterpillar dealership, 10 million fleet is laughable. So I can't, I've, I've realized I can't use that as the formula, but here's what the formula is. I look at fleet utilization. So each one of you, everybody on this mark on this call, should have an idea of what is their ideal utilization. And it's okay if you have seasonal lulls, like I get it. Starting in November, pretty good in December, January and February, there's about a 10 to 15% reduction in utilization. And that's normal markets, quote, seasonal trends, depending on where you're at in the United States. Hopefully you make up some of that business with temporary heating or snow removal. But if you don't, you need to look at that if you went six months, eight months, a year, and you're floating at 52 or sorry, 42 to 48% utilization, you have to ask yourself, why? Why aren't your sales where they need to be? Why were they so much higher two years ago? Why in 2021 were we at 68% and now we're at 48%? Hmm. Did you buy more fleet? Well, how did you change your infrastructure for more fleet? So I would look at, does your utilization control and dictate hiring and developing sales? The next thing I would look at is sales is expensive. And what I mean by that is it's not necessarily most salespeople, if you get a good one, will cover their own cost. They'll drive so much revenue, they don't cost your business anything. They'll actually grow your business. The problem is, is that first year of hiring a salesperson can be absolutely brutal because you hire them on, hey, Kyle, yeah, I want to sell for you guys. Um, and I'm going to need to make $125,000. And you go, okay, perfect. Well, how much are you going to produce? Well, nothing. The first year is just learning the business. That sucks. Like, that's terrible. So here's what I would recommend. I would look at coaching up and developing someone who plays a dual role. Now, if your business is bigger, and I know that there's people on this call that have an entire sales team, by all means, hire them and coach the crud out of them. I can help with that. I would love to give you, I'll give you any free stuff. If you're a Quipley fan, I will give you any free stuff you want because we all need to help each other. But if you're starting off and say, I've never had a salesperson but I want someone to start going out and developing leads and landing projects. If that's where you're at on this call, here's what I would do. I would find somebody who works your inside counter and on Wednesdays and Thursdays, they go make sales calls. I would make it that half of their calls need to be existing customers and they go out and visit with them, build rapport, thank them for their business and ask about future opportunities take those customers out to lunch, bring their job site breakfast burritos, and there you go. But then they also have KPIs, key performance indicators, goals, to go out and land new business, do cold calls, go to a job site, get a job card, find out who the subcontractors are on that job site, 
and go call on those subcontractors and earn the right to do business with those companies. I love it. We got, we got another question um, for someone else. Um, is it more beneficial to first develop a sales team and then invest in technology or should technology be integrated early to aid in building and scaling the sales teams? God, why do you got to have smart people on here? Um, that is a brilliant question. And I, I am a huge proponent of get the technology first. And I'll tell you why. Because if you hire on the entire sales team and then tell them, run with it, go sell, go have a great time. All right, stop. We're going to introduce a new piece of technology and we need you all to learn it. That's hard. Where if you go in and you say, look, part of your onboarding process is learn how to use this software. Your onboarding process is how to learn how to use whatever piece of software it is. Okay. So if, if somebody starts on, it's one of the things that you're battling with right now, Kyle, is people say, well, this isn't the way we've always done it. But the brand new rental companies that are just starting are like, this is amazing because they're learning it from ground one. But if somebody says, I've never done it this way and we're 50 years old, it's hard to make the change. Mm. So if I was going to do it, I would say, if you're going to build a sales team, start with the technology up front. Get a CRM, get a sales rep management tool, get something like a rep move, something to help your reps organize their day and use that from day one. Mm. And then when you grow the team, guess what? That's the standard. That's the benchmark. And then you don't have people coming in and saying, well, we've never done it this way. So technology first. Yeah, it's very hard to, to create change. Even if it's the best technology in the world, people are going to, I don't know if I want to learn this thing. It's too, right? It's much better to get the investment and the foundation built early on. I would agree with that. Um, I want to talk about hiring and then the onboarding side. Someone asked a question, actually, do you have any good training plans for onboarding new reps? Maybe you could talk to that. But even before the onboarding part, like, how do I hire a good salesperson? Where do I find them? How do I interview them? What am I looking for? How do I know I'm not making a bad decision? Brilliant. Um, this is one of the biggest things that everybody runs into. And here's the biggest problem. They go out and they specifically look for resumes that say rental equipment on it. I want somebody who's worked for Sunbelt, Sunstate, United Rentals, um, Equipment Share, and Bob's Rentals. Yeah. You don't. You actually don't. Because here's the thing. Guess what you can teach them? The rental world. That's the one thing everybody on this right now could teach somebody is the rental world. Mm. But what you can't teach is drive. You can't teach sales skills. You can't teach self-motivation. You can't teach competitive nature. You can't teach an entrepreneurial spirit. Mm. You either got it or you don't. But I'll tell you right now, I will take a collegiate athlete who worked on a farm over somebody who has 10 years in the rental industry at seven different rental companies. Now, as much experience as that person has, guess what? There's a reason why they didn't stay with one company for 10 years. Where that collegiate athlete that worked on a farm, they know what it's like to get up at six o'clock in the morning and go to a job site. They know what it's like to be coached. They're a collegiate athlete. How many coaches does the average collegiate athlete have? Maybe 10, 15 in their lifetime? Are they all good coaches? Nope. And guess what? They persevered. Wow. I love people that are classically trained musicians. Do you ever have the music right as a musician? Nope. You keep practicing. And when do you practice? Do you practice for everybody else? No. You practice in solitude. You work on that piece of music over and over and over and over. And the thing is, is that tenacity is what makes somebody go out and they go on a sales call and somebody says, Kyle, I'm not buying from you. And you say, not a problem. I'm going to go <laughs> back and I'll start all over tomorrow. But yet you find somebody and not everybody has that trait. They feel defeat and they're done. So if I was going to give one advice, do me a favor, stop scouring the internet for somebody with rental history. Scour the internet for somebody with a work ethic. Mm. Because you can't teach work ethic. If you bring somebody in who's plug and play, 
hey, this guy's got seven years in the rental industry. He's plug and play. Are you willing to compromise your culture? Are you willing to compromise what is your business? Mm. And somebody sat there and you're like, oh, I'm going to hire on, and I won't say a rental company, I'm going to hire on the number one guy from my competitor. And that guy comes in and guess what? This isn't the way you need to do things. And this, you don't need that in your company. I would rather hire on a 26-year-old college collegiate athlete or a returning Olympian or a former military person who says, look, I have the discipline to work hard every day and I'm coachable. Mm. Perfect. I can teach you everything you need. Yeah, I love that. Um, the work ethic part is so key. And, I, and even for our business, we have we have 18 employees. One of the 18 is from the rental industry. And I, you know, what we talked about yesterday is at the end of the day, the owner has to sort of decide what they want to do with the company and they got to live and die by that. And a lot of people told me that was a bad idea, um, that you didn't have a lot of people with rental experience. I don't have any rental experience, right? But obviously we talk to customers every single day. But what we did, we made some good hires, some bad hires. But the, the thing that we found on the great hires, there wasn't a common thread of they all went to the same school or had the same major. What the common thread of the, the top people were they were grinders. They like they just love the work. They do the work. They treat people well. And if you look at the resumes of our team, it's like, you know, it, it doesn't match. Right. But um, I'm, I'm just encouraged hearing you say that. Right. Because I, there's also an element of us. I was like, man, do we should we've hired like 15 people from United? No. Well, we didn't. And what we did was hire 15 people who can work their butt off. They worked their way through college. They were college athletes. They were military, things like that. Right. So but let me you, ask you this. Yeah. How much of and really think about it. how much have your customers Everybody on this call, how much have they taught you about the rental industry? I mean, I learned something new every single day. We all do. Your learning curve is through the roof. Yeah. But you have to be willing to learn. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the thing. You didn't say that, but you work at it, but also curiosity, I think is important too, right? And and um, humility and eager to be co coachability is another re really important thing, right? Because you can have a hard work ethic, but say, hey, look, I've, I've got it figured out. I'm the guy. I'm smarter than everyone here. Right. So it's not just blind work ethic, but it's the co coachability side, I think, is really important, too. Um, and the rental industry is very complicated. People told me that it was I was didn't know what I was doing, et cetera. And um, maybe we don't. But what I found was if you just have enough work ethic, curiosity, there's a lot of people who want to help. And the, the rental industry is full of people who want to teach you that to teach you the skills, et cetera. So I, I totally agree on the, on the work ethic side. And um so I just want to briefly talk about the onboarding side because we we sort of like this fact you found the people, you know, uh, high work ethic. They don't have the rental background, so you got to teach them that. What what's important on the onboarding side to make sure people get off to a, the good start those first ninety days, which are so critical. So, love that. Um, I will I will mention figure out how to do it. Um, I will send you a list of four books. I don't care if the people do it via audio book, if they sit down and they actually read them, or if they just kind of research it. But I will tell you right now, I hate, I won't, I won't bad mouth the company that I worked for, but literally my onboarding was, Hey, uh, I know you don't know anything about the rental business, but your pickup trucks out there, here's the keys. Um, and, uh, good luck. Good luck. And, and the problem with that is, is that it's okay if companies do that, but then you have to accept the responsibility of what it costs you every day. Mm-hmm. Now, what nobody discuss, and it's called opportunity cost. Hmm. If you hire the wrong person, what is it costing your company? And it's not measurable, but they're not selling. They're not skilled. They don't have anything. So the onboarding is mission critical. What I would do is I would build a foundation. I actually, today, I spent seven hours this morning from 5 a.m. until noon recording training videos just to help with employee onboarding because it's a real thing like you just mentioned yeah. but do me a favor build a foundation of sales training make your employees whoever's doing your outside sales or inside sales jump in a truck jump in a car and go with them as a business owner and visit customers teach them who the person is on the other side of the phone Spend time with them. Every employee that you bring on board, you have to once a week as a business owner, follow up with each one of your employees and say, what's working and what's not. 
And you better genuinely care and listen. If you're just, hey, is everything good? All right, you have a great week. All of a sudden, that person's seven months into their career, and you're like, hey, you're not doing a very good job. Who checked in on them for seven months? And then you let them go. Mm -hmm. And guess what you did? I won't even care about the ethical part of that you burned seven months of somebody's life because you didn't coach them. How much productivity and money did you waste as a business owner? When you do your onboarding, have a plan. If you need help with a plan, reach out with me. I will send you a plan of week one and write this down right now. Week one, spend two days with a driver. Spend two days with a field mechanic. Why spend time with a field mechanic? Because 50% of all service calls are operator error. That's proven. That's through United, Sunbelt, every 50% of all service calls are operator error. So if you spend two days with an outside service tech, and the only thing you need to ask that outside service tech is, what are the most common operator errors and how could I prevent them over the phone? Hmm. Now that's a smarter employee. Spend two days on the counter learning how we do business. Spend a day riding with the company owner and visiting with customers. There needs to be an onboarding process. Throwing somebody keys in the block is not the answer. Hmm. I know that's been um, near and dear to what you do, you know, with all the training you do, because I know the experiences you had early in, the, in your rental career you've shared with, which, uh, which is unfortunately way too common where you're given the keys. Good luck. You know, why didn't you sign anything today? Well, <laughs> you, know, you weren't trained. Right. And um, I, I love that's been your focus and, you know, seven hours of training videos today. I mean, it's important. And I think it's important um, even just for new customers too, on the onboarding side for new customers too. It's, it's just, I think people get so excited about, oh, I, I hired this person. I got this new customer. I'll see you later, right? But that's just really the start of the relationship. And the coaching, the onboarding is so critical for success of not just new customers, but also most importantly, your people. That's right. Absolutely. And and here's the biggest thing. And, and it's critical. Invest in your people. And it's sad because I watch companies and they will say, every single person on here, including you, Kyle, including me, knows who what an amazing employee looks like. Man, if I could just have 15 more Karens, if I could have 15 more Jimmys, if I could have 15 more of them, my business would be perfect. What have you done to build up those team members? What investments have you made? Are you just looking to hire somebody who's already built? Or are you willing to take the time to build an amazing team? You will never regret building up your team. Hmm. That's a great way to end this uh, today, Elliot. I know we got another session tomorrow. Um, other book I'm reading right now, Think Like a Horse. I don't know if you've read that one. Uh, I don't know Think Like a Horse. What is that all about? In Colorado, maybe. Uh, but but he he's a he's he he does a lot of coaching uh, with executives, but he also trains horses. And what he's sort of seen a lot of similarities similarities with how you onboard and train horses to, to how you coach people. But his whole thing was everyone's coachable. If, as long as you can see the one percent small amount of progress and hard work he'll stick with any horse and 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 it's we all love to have a players on day one but a lot of it is just the investment and even if you didn't hire the perfect person right out of the gate it's staying with them if they're showing improvement is the biggest thing are they putting the right work in they can become that a player uh, over time so anyways that, that's another book we're reading now but um excited for tomorrow elliot tomorrow unlocking new markets and niches so uh, the final day here um today was awesome around powerful sales team i think we just scratched the surface on all the stuff we could have talked about on the sales team, but um, awesome episode, Elliot. Thank you again for today. Thank you everyone else for, for the questions and for, for joining in. Outstanding. And thank you. Tomorrow we'll also dabble in with that new markets. We'll play with social media. All righty. Looking forward to it. So David asked, can we get recordings of this webinar? Uh, yes, David, will follow up with you uh, once this all wraps up. So, all righty. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Kyle. Have a blessed day. You too. See you tomorrow.